Thanks, Naresh. It's just to not avoid the confusion, uh, it's not my birthday today. It will be on Sunday, which some of the team know. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. No, thanks. It's great to be here. And it's actually, um, you know, really inspiring. I thought it was an inspiring day. I already mentioned that to you, Naresh. I'm inspired actually by, by the progress that I, that I see happening. And I really enjoyed James's story in the morning. I, the lights are a bit bright about the UK government. And I thought that was uh, also very inspiring. Somewhat reminiscent of our own journey. Sometimes we are the Ministry of Oil. Uh, so it's, it's not, not unlike our own journey. But again, I think there's a lot of progress made there. There's a lot of progress was made with Agile. And progress is actually a bit of a theme. And it's the theme that I, I, want to, I want to talk about. And, and, and in order to do that, I'll start with a personal story of why that is important to me. And walking around here, I, I said to several people, it looks rather colonial here. And I guess it is. It is an old hotel from the colonial days. I found that quite interesting. And this, there's actually in my own background a bit of colonial history as well. So to make that more real for you, I'm Dutch, as you may have guessed from my accent, but I don't look very Dutch. And that's because I actually, my, my, both my parents were born in the Dutch East Indies, which were then still a colony of the Netherlands, yeah? so now Indonesia. So I grew up with great food, like we have here. I grew up with the great spices. You know, I, I love the smell of that. And when I come here, I enjoy the spicy food. I grew up with great stories of long sea voyages people going to those places. And now you get on a plane, I'll get on a plane tonight, I'll be tomorrow morning back in the Netherlands. It's very, very different. So the sense of progress, and the sense of how that has advanced, is something that always fascinated me. At the same time, that pro progress is actually very fragile. My parents were born in the Dutch East Indies just before the Second World War. Uh, my mother was about five when the Second World War broke out. And as you may know, in those days, the Dutch, my mother was fully Dutch, my father was half Dutch, his mother was Japanese. The Dutch were sent to the Japanese prison camps. So my mother actually spent three years in, with her parents, with her mother, her father in a different camp, in a Japanese prison camp. So their life went like that, from having everything, they had a nice life, in a colonial setting, to having nothing. They survived the camps. They weren't like the death camps in Europe. But it wasn't very nice, I can tell you. Nor was it very nice for my father, who lived with his mother and his siblings without his father, because his father was also Dutch, going into one of the prison camps. So that has always given me a sense of progress is great. It's really great to see that, but it's also something that's very fragile. So that is kind of the theme that I think I want to talk to you about, and share with you a little bit about Shell's progress and Shell's journey. So, before I do that, I need to show you this slide. And this slide, I'll let you read it very quickly. It basically tells you that it's a great idea to buy Shell shares, but please don't do it on my advice. Yeah? So now that I've told you that, this is what I'm going to tell you about. So I want to tell you a little bit about Shell and our business context. Shell is a very purpose-driven company. And now you realize why I said talk about progress, because our purpose, relatively simply. We power progress by providing more and cleaner energy solutions to the world. We power progress by providing more and cleaner energy solutions. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the heart of our company and it's what we do things for. There are two big trends in society these days. One of them is digitalization and the digital transformation is what we're talking about today here, it's really great, but you can't do digitalization if you don't have energy. And the energy transition is the other big trend in our society. So being at the midst of those two trends, I think that's great. And I think I indeed have the coolest job maybe in the world, being in IT and being in the energy business. So I'm the CIO of our integrated gas and new energy business, the part of Shell, not the whole of Shell, and but I'll come back to how that works, and I also sponsor Agile for Shell. So hence, indeed, I feel like, well, I don't really feel like a practitioner. I feel I'm trying to be a leader into, in this journey. And that change is indeed not easy. So I will talk a little bit more about what's happening. I'll show you a few things. I'll also talk about our problems. 
you like around that. So firstly, a little bit about Shell. I'm showing you a nice infograph with some figures just to dazzle you. It is a very big company. These are 2016 figures. Our 2017 annual report is about to be published. So these are from the 2016 annual report. So a lot of people. In 2016, we generated $21 billion of cash flow from our operations. As you remember, maybe the oil price was a little bit low then still, so it's recovered a bit. So this year was already a little bit better, around about 35. And one of the things we're very proud of is we built, that we beat our fiercest competitor, ExxonMobil. We actually built them, beat them solidly last year by generating more cash from our operations, something we're a little bit proud of. We have 30 million customers, so just let that sink in for a moment. We deliver uh, fuel and other stuff to them through our 43,000 retail stations. Bigger than Starbucks, bigger than McDonald's. So you don't always realize that, but this is a big operation. In 2016, we delivered 30 million tons per annum of LNG. Actually, last year that went up to 33 million tons per annum. Last year, we became more gassy than oil. We believe gas is a very important part of the energy transition. So you see oil fading slightly to the background, and gas becoming more important. But also new energies, very, very important. The 2% is also quite important. So yes, it's big, there's a lot happening, but it's only 2% of the world's oil production delivered through Shell. So, you know, in that sense, it's also not very big Either. So there are a lot of more numbers here. One billion dollar spent on R&D. Again, quite big. If you look at it, it is actually in a way a very traditional value chain. And you can see how that value chain, how that supply chain, if you like, works. So all the way from exploration, where we find the oil and the gas, then getting it out of the ground, developing it, extracting it, making it into something through our plants, transporting it, trading it, and delivering it to customers. So, in a way, a very traditional value chain, as ripe as any value chain for disruption. So we take disruption very, very seriously. I was listening to some of the conversations, yeah, so, um, how does disruption work in many different industries? Well, clearly, we are not immune to that. At the same time, what you can also notice from this, this is a very waterfall-oriented supply chain with some very, very deep silos. You need to be a scientist in most of these to really make a difference. Yeah, so to have studied geoscience, be able to interpret seismic, that takes a while. Can you then also be a specialist around marketing? Well, probably not. Yeah, so you start, it start, start to see some hints of why digital transformation or agile are difficult in this industry. Now, a bit about the, the context, and I've already said it. I said the two big trends in our society at the moment are the energy transition and digitalization. You see that reflected in a quote from our CEO, from Ben Van Burden, who was here last week, actually. He made an extensive visit to India, amongst others spoke to uh, the Prime Minister. Quite some length. So uh, it's quite nice to see that. This is the challenge facing the world. By 2050, we will have 9 billion people on the planet. Because of that, and because of the fact that also people will increasingly move to cities, so now it's about 50% who live in cities. By 2050, it'll be 75% of the population that will live in cities. Energy demand will double. Now, in my country, the Netherlands, Everybody thinks, oh, yeah, we need to get, get rid of all this bad oil and, and uh, we need to get into a hydrocarbon-free world and we have some earthquakes in the north caused by the, de the, the gas production and, oh, we need to get rid of gas. Well, keep on dreaming. That's not going to happen that soon. Already this moment, in the world, there are 1.2 billion people who have no access to energy whatsoever. There's another billion, some of them live in this country, who don't have access to reliable energy. Yeah, so this is a problem that is already there now and is increasing in the future. I 
find it a very interesting statistic that at this moment there are there is about 27 billion dollars spent on people off the grid charging their mobile phones and, and using light. So there's a great commercial opportunity in a way here as well that, that we are taking very serious. The new energy business is taking advantage of. So that is the business context, that is the challenge. Now indeed I already talked about disruption and new technologies. You see some of them listed here. You see also again a representation of that value chain. And in all those parts of the different value chain, it is about creating new opportunities, protecting some of our markets, and figuring out what does it mean to be digital? How can we use digital services to be better? And around that value chain that I showed you, we will move at different speeds. Some of those parts are already very much there. I talked about the retail business, our 43,000 retail sites. That's a consumer business. So it's much more apt to already embrace digital. In other parts of the business, like I explained, exploration, production, in a way is much more difficult. But it's going on, and we have now a very clear strategy around that. So I want to show you a short video that gives you an inkling of how we take this journey. Digital technologies and trends are transforming the way we live and work. Mobile devices connect billions of people to each other and the digital world around them. We are at a tipping point of exponential technological advancement. In the coming years, the Internet of Things will consist of a trillion sensors all generating and sharing data. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are no longer science fiction. They are already automating and optimizing operations. Digital technologies drive cost efficiency, provide new revenue opportunities and change business models. They will redefine the oil and gas industry. Today's reservoir models are manually updated with seismic, drilling and production data. As systems become more integrated, reservoir models will be autonomously updated in real time. Continually improving our understanding of the subsurface enables us to maximize recovery from new and existing fields. The Internet of Things creates unprecedented connectivity, providing a wealth of data. Aggregating data from diverse sources will enable better decision-making and deliver huge competitive advantage. We will be able to anticipate and autonomously manage conditions to maintain optimized asset performance. This will transform maintenance and operational efficiency. Digitalization already enables hundreds of millions of dollars in value to Shell each year. It will contribute further to efficiency and productivity gains, estimated to be worth a trillion dollars across the industry over the next decade. On the retail side, intelligent systems will alter our relationships with customers. By treating every customer as an individual, we will deliver a personalized and more convenient service. New energies and digitalization are reshaping the energy market. The rise of autonomous cars, electrification and the sharing economy will establish new business models and opportunities for digital services. Industry boundaries are blurring. By investing heavily in new energy and digital technologies, new entrants are quickly emerging as competitive threats to incumbents. Customers will source energy from a wide and growing range of suppliers. New platforms will emerge to connect this supply with demand. Leaders in this space are yet to emerge, but they will influence the whole industry when they do. Shell's deep understanding of energy systems, affinity with technology, and expertise in integration puts us in a prime position to compete in this digital future. So, that gives you a bit of a glimpse of what our thinking is like and where we believe the future is going and how important it is for us. And if you look at this slide, which I think is, is, is quite interesting, I also think digitalization itself plays a role in the energy transition. So what you see here is a graph. It's, it's, it's not a shell graph, it's actually from the Global East Sustainability Initiative, who postulate that digital technologies can help us reduce CO2 essentially by 2030 by 
which would mean we would keep CO2 emissions at 2015 levels. So that's, that's massive, that's massively important, obviously, for, for the planet, basically. I am proud to work for a company that takes climate change seriously. Not oil and gas companies do, not all of our competitors do, but we do. Coming back to this power and progress together by providing more and cleaner energy solutions. So it's very, very much about that. The oil and gas industry, as I already explained, is in fact lagging in digitalization. Okay? You can imagine in such, and, and it doesn't go for all, the whole value chain as I already explained, but where the investments are so massive, where the asset intensity is so high, and also where the risks are very, very high. We work in a business where unfortunately every year people still die. It's a very risky business. So we take safety extremely seriously. And that also means we, we, we plan very carefully when we do very dangerous things, like drilling a high pressure well in the deep water gulf of Mexico. I don't need to explain that to you. I think you remember what happened with BP quite a few years ago. Devastating for the environment and devastating for BP. It halved their share price, brought, almost brought the company to its knees. So we do dangerous things. We need to think about it very carefully. However, it also points to you that there is a great opportunity. You see that reflected here. So the video already gave you some idea. In many cases, digitalization for us is not new something that we've been doing for a long time already. We've talked about exploration a couple of times. Exploration, in a way, is digitalization already for the last 30 to 40 years. There is no way to actually stick your head under the ground and just have a look if there's any oil and gas. You will need to do that by using signal processing, by using digital techniques, and that is also about big data. We heard about the genomes. Well, I can tell you the seismic cubes are also very, very, very large. So a lot of that is already ongoing. We are now increasingly also see that this is not, we're not doing digitalization for digitalization's sake, but we really see that it needs to be part of our way of doing things. And it's definitely also not something about the future, it is about getting going now. The way we look at it is essentially in three focus areas. So we try to use existing technologies, fixing our existing business applying it to existing business problems. And like I said, we've been doing that for quite a while already. There's lots of new technologies and new solutions emerging that we can apply also to our current business problems. So if you look at the integrated gas business, which is the most, the biggest part of my business, that's where we focus most. It's a very high asset intensive business, focus in those two areas. But I think the really exciting thing about um, digitalization, and we've talked a lot about that in this conference, is where there are new possibilities, new business models emerging. And the new energies business, which is something we've started on fairly recently, is really embracing that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that further in the presentation. So if you look at the integrated gas business, and again, this is a different type or a different way of visualizing that supply chain, then all across that value chain, supply chain, we are making use of digital technologies and digitalization. So I already talked a little bit about exploration data, really exciting stuff happening there, stuff that I, I come from, I have a subservice background, I didn't really realize that that would be possible. We were doing seismic in the cloud. We're applying um, advanced analytics and, and even AI to determining where are petroleum systems and what are the right structures and where should we drill. We have a moonshot, where we believe that within the next five years there will be a completely AI drilled well. Very, very exciting. More further, if you like, downstream in our manufacturing and in our plants and in our gas plants, we, we uh, look at monitoring of equipment, both remote monitoring and as well as proactive monitoring. Again, applying advanced analytics techniques. And, and data gathering in different types of ways. So we're experimenting with drones, or we're using drones, for instance, for flash tech inspections. But we're also having connected workers, people who have our field in a mobile enabled. Both bring data from the field and data to the field. So those are nice examples. In our shipping business, we look at how do we optimize routes? How do we optimize the, the loading of the ships? 
to really uh, take the most advantage of best route planning and those types of things. And energy trading, and again, you saw some glimpses of that in the video as well. How do we optimize across that value chain? How do we optimize across outside shell as well? And the whole power, power game, power trading, power grid, etc. that's going to really be the game changer there. As I already mentioned, we're also doing some things to drive new business models. The little car that just drove in on the slide, we call it Shell Tap Up. And it's actually part of our retail business. It's not necessarily outside, it is in the retail business, and they're disrupting themselves. Some of our traditional retailers don't like that at all. Hang on, we're delivering fuel to people's home where their cars are parked, but we want them to come to our shop and buy some other stuff. Well, we think if we don't do this, somebody else will. So we're truly disrupting ourselves. There. So it's a nice little, you have, of course, you have a little app, and you order it, etc., etc. So it's a great example. The sense example that you see on the slide is part of our shell technology ventures. So we have our own technology venture fund where we invest in relevant technologies. This is a thing that will monitor your power at home monitor the usage of your energy devices at home. And you've taken a stake in that, you've invested in that. And we believe it will go big. We hope it will go big. So that's another way of how we're driving for new business models. Perhaps the most interesting one are the other two on the, on the slide. They're part of our digital ventures group. So within our new energy team, we try to be digital natives from the start. So the, the, the one at the bottom called Fitcar, uh, Maresh just gave away a Fitbit, I have one as well. So it's, it's essentially as simple as that. So your Fitbit, you have an associated app, you watch how you're doing, how your steps are doing. Well, you have an associated app with something in your car, and you can monitor the health of your car. And putting much more decision power and visibility into the hands of customers. Fair Pilot is aimed at high mileage drivers. So think of Uber, Lyft, taxi drivers. And um, basically, it gives them a clue, and it's independent from them, it gives drivers a clue of where their next customer most likely will be. Because that, we find, is the biggest friction that these users have. We have a very simple, very easy to use app, because also a lot of the uh, drivers actually don't really uh, know how to use technology very well, so it's extremely simple to use. And what I find most interesting about this one is this is almost like a reverse uh, disruptor. Because what Fairpilot as a venture is starting to do, they are hiring taxi drivers. And they are putting their own taxi drivers on the road. So this is almost like a reverse Uber. Where we're also, in a way, thinking about could we disrupt Uber. If this is an experiment. So this is a nice example of too agile. It's a small experiment. Let's hire a few drivers. Let's see what happens. So I think this is a great example and quite exciting. So obviously, and I think that has been the theme for the day, at least for some of the talks that I attended, the, the change is not a change in technology. It is actually a change in culture and a change in mindsets. And in this industry and in our company, there are still some pretty clear blockers. One of the obvious blockers, and I already talked about how dangerous this business can actually be and how people still die in this business, is regulations. In many, many countries, there are very strict regulations about how you do things. 3D, pins, 3D printing of parts, for instance, is a nice example. We think it has major potential. But will the regulator in country X actually allow you to do this? Can you get certification for those parts, etc., etc.? There are a lot of you know, protective barriers around those types of things. The lack of standards is another example where it becomes difficult to do certain things. And then, maybe most importantly, indeed, still our own company and our own structures. And I've seen some nice examples that we're not alone in that. And I heard somebody say, culture eats agile for breakfast. Well, clearly, indeed, that is still the case for us. This is a, uh, we are a strong company with a strong culture ourselves, but it's also an industry with some very strong embedded ways of doing things. If you want to build something big, like you see here at the background, and you work with other big companies with a very long supply chain where the, the in incentives to truly change, to truly become digital, are actually difficult. 
they're not there. Their margins are very small, they haven't been investing in it, and their supply chain themselves are taking quite large. So that is still what is facing us, and still one of the major challenges. So the way we attack that is indeed by attacking digital transformation, by, by going on a digital transformation journey. What I find very exciting is that this has become a board topic. It's become a topic where indeed, uh, obviously as an IT executive team, it's something we talk about, so I think it's exciting to be in IT. But what I now see is the business executive team that I participate in are having this on the agenda as well. Literally, in a couple of weeks, I'll be with the integrated gas team and the leadership team, and we have dedicated time to talk just about this position. And we have, across the group, established digital focal points who have their own organization who are working through this digital transformation. And I'm, I'm heartened by some of the things that I heard in the presentations today. So, for instance, somebody talked about beyond budgeting. I thought that was a nice example. When I talked to the head of our global commercial business, or our B2B business, where we sell lubricants and, and these types, he told us a story where his boss, the head of downstream, John Abbott, asked him, okay, how much are you going to spend on digital this year? He said, I don't know. And I said, come on, you have to be kidding. Surely you have a budget for digital. He said, well, John, no, I, I don't have a budget for digital. What I can tell you is that whenever I spend, I will do it either because it's a small experiment and I, I'm okay with it to fill, or I'm in scale-up mode and I'm actually succeeding. But I can't tell you how much it's going to be. So that to me kind of sounds like beyond budgeting. So that, that to me sounds pretty hopeful. So clearly what we want to do is we want to be digitally literate. We want our business to be digitally literate as well. We want to think customer centric, but as I hope it's also clear from my presentation, that's not always obvious what that actually means. Who is your customer if you're a, an explorer? You don't really have a customer. You don't really have a customer even if you're an oil producer. Your oil gets sold on the open market. So how do we flex that? Well, as we, at least in the IT world, it's clear we can still talk about user-centric. So user-centric, that, that at least is something that we can work with. But customer-centric is not always clear. What is clear, of course, is that we won't have faster time to value. But like I explained, in some cases, this value chain can, can last anywhere from 10 to 15 years because from finding actually gas to having it truly in the hands of a customer or a user is a very long value chain. So we need to think about that in different ways as well. So in summary, I hope I've stimulated a little bit some of the thinking for you as well, and I've showed you a little bit about how a user, in Russia's word, actually handles agile but also, more importantly, embarks on a digital transformation. Our, different, our businesses are moving at different speeds. Those that have much more true customer facing, like our retail business or our commercial business, they actually are faster at this, and, and, and rightly so. And they need to because the competitive pressures are there. Our new energy business, as I explained, and you see some of the examples here on the bottom, they are trying to be digital natives from the start, and these digital vendors are, in fact, that. They are operating arm's length from Shell. Shell often has a stake, and other venture capitalists also have stakes. So it's really very, very, very digital business. And some of our more traditional business, where we run a plant or where we try to get real wells, it will be more targeted. We will also have digital transformation there, but it will be more targeted. And it is, in the end, all about powering progress together, together by providing more and cleaner energy solutions for the world. So, thank you, and I hope we have some time for questions.